Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Today's webinar will be about Perspective Flow and Dynamics for Sketching in Cliff Studio Paint, presented by Mariana Noroña. Before we begin the webinar, there are some housekeeping items that I would like to go through. This webinar will be approximately one hour long and all attendees will be muted. There will be a Q&A in the last 15 minutes of the webinar. You can use the question box uh, for sending your questions and also to interact with us. Uh, the chat panel is only used for announcement, so you can read anything from there. Um, this webinar has been recorded and will be shared via email and also you can find it in our YouTube channel. The panelists for this webinar are Mario Quiñones, myself, and Mariana Noroña. For those of you who connect with us for the very first time or have never heard about Clip Studio Paint, Clip Studio Paint is your only one solution for stunning, ready to publish illustrations, comics, manga, and animations. Learn more at clipstudio.net forward slash n and graphicsly.com. Also, we invite you to share your Instagram stories using the, using the hashtag webinar at NoroniaStastic, at Graphicsly, at Wacom, and at Clip Studio Official. We'll be sharing your stories if you tag us. Mariana is a visual development artist for feature animation, TV, and games. Her work experience includes Nickelodeon Animation, Blue Zoo Animation Studio, Botany Manor, 16 South, and Paper Roll Films. She also hosts regular plein air painting events with Warrior Painters. So with that, I will leave you with Mariana and her presentation, Perspective, perfect, perspective Flow and Dynamics for Sketching in Cliff Studio Paint. Thank you so much. Hey guys, uh, how's it going? Uh, thank you so much for having me back on. It's always such a delight to um, be on these. So um, if you don't know me, uh, I'm Mayam and uh, I'm a visual development artist for um, TV animation, feature animation and games. So um, I doing visual development art. Uh, my, speci uh, my specialty uh, is actually environments um, because I really, really love um, being able to look at a place and uh, knowing who lives there and what happens there. So uh, in my art, I usually um, go for um, moments of daily life and things that make me feel, uh, feel something. So it could be someone just opening the door for me on um, when I go in and enter a building, someone giving me a smile or uh, finding that my, um, my friend is uh, giving me a special gift, like these little things that make me feel um, nice and um, also create these nice little memories. And a lot of the time, um, we don't really see these in, in uh, photographs or something. So um, when you actually look back, uh, you really want to immortalize those moments. So that's what I usually try to do with my art. And I'm also, a very big nerd. <laughs> so I really uh, like uh, perspective. I really love uh, the mathematics that goes behind um, the visual art. Um, so uh, that that's what really drives me to creating uh, these environments. So how do they actually work? Who who lives there? And um, what makes how how do I feel um, about them? So um, even when I'm just on the train or just walking down the street, I picture these storylines going around and um, having ideas is one thing, but how do I make them into a reality? How do I make them believable? So uh, that's where I'm going to be talking to you guys about today uh, because a great way of um, doing that is by using perspective and uh, realistic um, techniques. So um, it could, can be anything from just my friend's cat who doesn't like me, <laughs> as you can tell, or just um, something fun like going on a road trip with your friends or even just the crunch that you have before you have a big deadline to, to hand in. Um, so uh, I'm going to be walking you through uh, my process. So 
the, the amazing thing about art is that it's different for everyone. Um, so I'll be telling you what goes on in my brain. So something that may work for me may not work for you. And uh, just take it with a pinch of salt and let's have fun with it. So process. First of all, what is exactly perspective? So perspectives uh, has to be has to do with the perceived depth and volume of the world around you, and uh, that uh, is entirely dependent on lenses. And if you're like me, you're going to think lens and immediately think, oh, camera. But the really cool thing is, uh, is not just the camera; it's actually also your eyes. And uh, because your eyes are lenses, because they capture the light and give you a certain image. Um, but at the same time, uh, your eyes work differently uh, than those of other animals. So you will see the world different than your dog does and different than an eagle in the sky does, um, which is really, really cool. So yeah, uh, in terms of animation, which is where I work um, at the most, for me, perspective uh, has to do a lot with the camera. So when, I, uh, when I'm working as a background artist, for instance, I will receive boards uh, from storyboard artists, from, from animatics. And this gives me uh, the information uh, that the, they want on the screen and what kind of camera and where it, where it is and what angle it, it is and the uh, focal length as well. So when I make my backgrounds, I'm actually matching all of that. So it all comes together. And the big thing is, you're an artist, you're not a technician. So you're meant to be bringing something to the table, right? I'm not just supposed to make something that's technically accurate. I'm supposed to make it fun and appealing. So if I just uh, take all my time to make something uh, technically accurate and well measured, I will end up with something believable, but also very boring. <laughs> like, look at this building, it is so solid. Yeah, it's also very ugly. But um, yeah, so I uh, divide these, uh, my user perspective in two different stages. So there's the concept stage in which I use perspective, perspective very, very loosely. So I'm getting my ideas down, I'm going with the flow, I want it as sketchy as, and flowy as I possibly can. This is so that um, I get all of the raw energy out and I'm not worried about, oh, this has to converge to this vanishing point or this measurement doesn't match that one because then I'm not getting a nice looking, um, interesting design and I'm also not making it nice and solid. So the beginning, I throw all the rules out the window and I just doodle, sketch, make it weird, it doesn't matter. Once I have something that I really like, that's when we go into the execution. And then I get my engineer hat on and I will make it solid and believable as I possibly can. While, very important, having my concept sketches right on the screen and I keep comparing them. So as I'm executing it and um, being very, very precise with my measurements and my um, horizon line and grids, I'm making sure that I have all the passion and all the energy from the initial sketch. So that's what perspective is. Um, I will throw, uh, give you a little insight into my brain and what goes on um, when I'm actually doing these things. So first things first, I actually start drawings by not drawing. <laughs> So uh, I used to be very impulsive and just get something on, on the paper as soon as I could. And then, you know, I would just want to immediately render. Um, and then I would get frustrated because it would end up underbaked and not nice. So as I became more experienced, um, it um, became much more important and much more clear to me that I have to know what I'm talking about. Because art is a means to show something, uh, to communicate. Well, if you're just going and saying something without having a story to tell, you're not really saying much, are you? So um, it's very important for me to just sit down, get some scrap paper, get my sketchbook and uh, write down the ideas I have. Uh, it could be that, I don't know, I've been stressed like many times and uh, maybe I want to draw something about someone who's stressed. And how does that make me feel? 
and I write these down, oh, I feel like spiraling, I feel pressure, I feel like all these little words, and I put them down on the paper. And then from then on, I start thinking, okay, where will this be set? Will, it, will this be in the library? What will my character be doing? Oh, she will be studying. Okay, cool. Uh, is it a library? Is she at work? Um, is she in her room? I would be writing all of these things down and then thinking, okay, cool. Uh, if it's in a room, where is it placed? Where, you know, uh, like, what, what does the city look like? Uh, that's important because if you have a window, <laughs> it's made of glass, you will have to look through it. So that will come in relevant much later. Um, after I've answered these bits, I go into a stage that I like to call free sketching. So this is what I was talking about earlier, where there are no rules. Uh, I just go and sketch these ideas as they come uh, into my head. And it helps me to just do it in a bit of a beat up sketchbook or a, a draft paper because then I'm not precious. Um, I, in, my instinct is to be very precise. So the way I fight that is by um, sometimes using bits of cardboard <laughs> to paint or uh, to sketch because I am not afraid to fail. I'm not afraid to make a bad drawing that will ruin my sketchbook. I can just draw it and as nonsensical and loose and dynamic as I possibly can. And this is where I really see the core of the ideas. Then once I have a bunch of these, um, I go and cross a lot of them out because uh, they just don't work. And I have a much more solid idea of what I want. So, okay, this character will be in her room. She'll have a window uh, by her side. This is what she can see. Um, and I start putting on the architect hat and uh, deciding on a floor plan. So when I'm rendering, uh, I'm building something in space and it really helps me to organize um, uh, organize my thoughts uh, by having uh, a top-down uh, view. Uh, it also uh, can uh, troubleshoot issues. Like if I'm working as a background artist, uh, which I, I do a lot, our environments are actually stages for characters. So they will need space to move and uh, interact with things. So this is a great way to figure out whether or not um, this room will work for um, the other departments. Um, and once I have a floor plan, uh, I oftentimes take it into a next, uh, a following stage, which is called shoebox view. And uh, usually in an isometric perspective, where uh, isometric because um, all the, um, the measurements are live, like there's no deformation there. So you can just measure it and compare all the elements to each other. So it really, really helps when you're building things and you're not, ha not having to uh, worry about oh, what is the actual size of this thing? How does this interact? Um, it's a lot of prep work, but it then really helps to, make, uh, to put it all together. Once all of those bits are answered, so what is happening, where is this happening, and um, all of these <laughs> little factors that uh, come in are decided, I go on to thumbnails. And uh, this is essentially me putting the camera down. So what am I looking at? Uh, how do I want the audience to feel? And uh, if you're working um, in animation, you will, you will receive uh, a board, and you will have to interpret what the uh, board artist has made. Do we want just um, a nice and, and scenic um, angle? Are we just styling the shot? Um, are we making it a bit more dreamy with a Dutch angle, perhaps? Are we making it more of an insect's point of view or a dog's point of view? Or are we going with a more dramatic and pressure heavy uh, point of view? And um, the, all these things will in, uh, impact the way you set up your perspective, because uh, you can have like a one point perspective, but you have on the first one that makes you feel quite calm, it's quite relaxed, there's nothing going on here. And then you have like, this three point perspective, um, uh, quite the form one on the bottom that makes you feel uneasy. Like, why does this bed look menacing? And um, that is all because of the placement of the camera and the perspective choices that you make on there. Once you have decided on which one you want to go for, then that's where the grids and the adjustments come in. So once you know what you want, 
it's time to start putting on the engineer hat. So this is what this is the big step between the concept and the execution in in my head. <laughs> Sorry, um, I put down the grids, uh, which are a very handy tool on uh, Flip, and um, I try to adjust them as much as I can to the thumbnail. And uh, since I've been drawing very loosely, it's not an exact match, and that's okay. So I uh, change the grids and I go back and change the thumbnail and I just, just keep going back and forth until I have something uh, that I'm happy with. And it's important to take as much time as you need at this stage. Once that is done, this is a very important one. Uh, place characters to check your scale. So as things recede into space and as we add elements, they all need to be proportionate. Um, proportionate to each other. It can be very scary in terms of maths, but it's very easy when you just place characters in your scene. If you're having a character um, and you, you place different copies and they're all in the same plane and the same altitude, then the horizon line, which is this line over here, will intersect them all at the same um, place. So if you place them throughout your scene, you can use it as a term of comparison. Like, oh, is this bed high enough? Um, if it um, uh, reaches about waist height, then you're good, a little bit below. If your bed is reaching about your head height, um, that would be a bit hard to get onto it, don't you think? Um, so putting the character down really helps to see these problems before they come to life. And lastly, trial and error. Honestly, uh, there's a lot of back and forth that goes on. And uh, when I was starting out, I just really wanted my first thing to be the best thing ever. Um, but it, it just doesn't work that way. And it's okay to take as much time as you need, go back, readjust, go back, readjust until you have something you're happy with. Because then you can really push it forward and not be worried about the, the outcome. So how does this actually come to be? So you remembered I was talking about that stressed out drawing? Well, here we are. And these are the thumbnails I used. Um, I had a very dramatic one with an inverted triangle on the bottom, which was a three point uh, perspective. Um, and I also had some more grounded ones that were just more contemplative. And I ended up going with the vortex one because that's how I feel when I'm stressed. So um, then I, I asked myself, how do I, you know, show this with, uh, what's the best perspective to show this? And I went with a fisheye because that's how things feel. It feels like everything, you know, is exploding towards me. So that's the one I chose. Um, I'm going to go a little bit more in depth with the process with this, uh, with this piece. This uh, is from a personal project of mine. So um, remember I said earlier about taking uh, bits from uh, my day-to-day -day life and making stories about them. So on this specific case, uh, I took this photo at uh, the San Sombiento in, in Porto, uh, which is uh, similar to, uh, close to where I'm from. And I really love the uh, little, uh, the, the, the buzz of uh, people, uh, worlds colliding and some people are going there, some people are going the other way, what are they doing? And you have this rush going on. That was the, um, the bit that I um, based these piece, uh, this project um, on. So this character is supposed to uh, be going to his friend's bachelor party, but then wakes up and he is not at his friend's bachelor party because he fell asleep on the train and now he's lost. And I wanted that feeling of stepping on a platform it has happened to a few friends of mine more than once. They just fall asleep and end up somewhere that they don't know where they are and I find that hilarious. So that's what I started with and I'm going to just put this one for reference. Um, so from that picture I made a few quick drawings and uh, I like this one. It's very scribbly, my brain works fast, I know, uh, but I really like the feeling of speed that I was getting with these um, the sketches. Uh, once I got uh, the one I liked, which was this one, I then added the grids in. And at this stage, I was really uh, thinking about making it work. So um, I'm, we'll just go one by one. I wanted this vanishing point uh, matching the tunnel because I really wanted the, the character, uh, the character, the audience to feel like they're being pulled in. 
um, I wanted a second uh, vanishing point, which is like there, <laughs> yonks away, um, because uh, it gives it a sense of naturality. It's not just dead on like Wes Anderson style, it's a bit more natural, a bit more like handheld. And then I wanted a third point to also give a little bit of uh, power to, to the station, like these arches, uh, but I didn't want it to be too extreme to, to not make it too, too scary. So from this point on, uh, I readjusted my drawing once I put uh, the grids in and made it match better and uh, I put the ideas down a little bit more. And from then on, once I was happy enough with the sketchy loose part, I start measuring. So let's have a look at the reference uh, photo. You see these arches right here? They will be the same distance uh, as these ones, as these ones, and these ones, and blah, 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 until it gets to the tunnel. So as things recede into space, they obey the same ratio because uh, this has been taken with uh, one photo taken with one camera, one lens. So in order for it to be believable, it has to respect that. The time for wonkiness will come later. Now we're getting more into the engineering stage. Engineering hat on, roller in hand, we will measure and construct, measure and construct. So from those um, sketches that are, uh, those measurements that I've done, so I, I do a square uh, cross, uh, double cross to get the middle and then converge it to the vanishing point and then go from the diagonal to the halfway point to get the exact same measurement. It's a lot of maths, I know. Um, but then I know that these are precise measurements. From those, I then go and start building uh, the roof. So as you can see, you have these structures. And I do a very simplified version of that. So I'm just measuring, getting a feel of the space. It also really, really helps to put down grids. So uh, these are actually squares. So this way I know that this edge is the same length as this edge. And Spoiler alert, is the same length as this edge. And we go on, go on, go on. This is super helpful because then when I put characters in, when I put anything in, I have a point of reference. So if I put a ticket machine here and it takes two tiles, I will know that whatever I put here in here that takes two tiles, I'll be thinking, is this bigger than that ticket machine? And I'll, be ha I'll, I'll have to be thinking about that constantly. And uh, the foolproof method to do that is to add your character. So like I was saying before, you will hook your uh, character to the horizon line over here. Uh, it just goes over his uh, pretty little bald head. And I place him all around uh, the station. And I keep this on a layer on top of everything so that I keep uh, turning it on and off and on and off. And it's not supposed to be jumping. I just drag the layer by accident. Um, but I just keep putting uh, him on so I have something to compare it to. Then uh, I keep measuring more and <laughs> dividing more. So I wanted to draw the, um, the, 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 the trains. So I look at my reference and think, okay, how much space does a train take? Okay, uh, this takes about almost the entirety of the platform. So it goes all the way down, but it has to be very careful when getting close to the horizon line because things get very squashed um, very quickly, um, the depth I mean. So I measured this one and then, okay, how long is this one compared to the other one? About the same. Okay, cool. Put that down. Then the other one, <laughs> sorry. Um, and I kept comparing them and I actually changed a few things uh, because I didn't want it to feel too robotic. So I put one a bit for the back, one a bit um, in the front, just to keep it nice and loose. Um, and then once I was happy with that, I started dividing it. So um, that's what you do. If you have something complex, you just put it in a box, uh, measure it, and then start dividing it. That's how I got this diagonal, which matches this little uh, beveled edge on the, the front of the train. Cool, right? So moving on, I then do some more measuring again and just keep going back and forth, adding my characters in. Um, and from then on comes a more fun bit. Since I spent all that time correcting and measuring and correcting and measuring, I now have a standing point 
to go and get a little bit looser. So I'm very, I'm a very painterly person. I'm very sketchy, and um, I like to go nice and rough on top of uh, my drawings, and I can do that provided that I've properly measured. If I just went rogue and just drew like I'm, I have drawn here without that, there will be issues. <laughs> So now that I've uh, sketched those strings in, I then go back uh, to the station itself and then do the same thing to the arches. So as I, um, I like to do things in stages, so I will measure something, detail it, then go back, compare it to what I've already drawn, make sure that it all fits before going and uh, measuring, uh, and sorry, and detailing more. Uh, also important, like even though you're getting letting loose, you have to use your rulers to make sure that things are aligned. Um, in, in real life, things are never perfectly aligned, but they are just enough because there's wear and tear, because there's wonkiness, there's um, so many things. But you have to just make sure that if that information comes across uh, nice and easily. So um, again. Rinse and repeat, same thing, uh, just turn that off so it's easier to see. Uh, we go back to the gates, and then I went a bit crazy with this one, okay? <laughs> you can go crazy as long as you remember where your planes are facing. So it has to have a front plane, it has to have a, a, a side plane, and at this stage, just really keeping track of it. It is not hard. Perspective is a lot of things. It is not hard. It's a lot of simple um, uh, concepts. The issue is to keep up with all of them at the same time. It's like, you can deal with one kid, fine. But when you go to a kindergarten, you have like 20 kids running at the same um, same time. So that's how I feel about perspective. <laughs> and same thing, did details, did some more measuring, and then more details until you have a full layout. It's also super, super important to keep track of where your, uh, plant, uh, your planes are. So you have a foreground, middle ground, and background and um, keep track of where everything is because then it will make your life so much easier and your composition so much more fun. And once you've done all that work, congratulations, you can go in and paint without a care in the world. Um, so yeah, uh, in general, BG design is a lot about um, measuring stuff. So I did this piece in um, Angela Sung's uh, BG design class, which was absolutely amazing. Um, you can uh, catch a lot of perspective classes on Warrior Art Camp uh, that will really help boost your skills. So something that uh, I learned there was how important it was to have uh, shoebox um, views of your uh, designs. So like I said before, when you're rendering and when you're really designing a, a space to get it to look like this, this is not the first time that I've drawn this. Um, if it was the first time, it would have come out very ugly and really super underbaked. So what I'm actually doing here is I'm constructing it and I'm looking at my shoebox and going, okay, um, how many stoves can I fit in this width? Uh, how, how tall is the fridge in comparison to the shelf? And um, how many of my characters fit between, sorry, uh, this side and this side? Um, this is giving me all the information I need so that I can build it. It's also super, super important. Uh, so this is one side, this is the other side. It's super important um, to have these in, in animation so that everyone is working from the same information and, you know, in a 2D project. But in a 3D project, it's, it becomes even more crucial because you are handle, handing this to the modelers and to the 3D department. Um, you are telling them, okay, build this, and it has to have all the information. They have to know how big things are, uh, how they compare to each other, what kind of um, direction they go in, like, what they're, what's, how do the shapes work, and um, this is why it's so important to have these clear drawings. So, in general, let loose, sketch, and then create an actual plan so you can follow and other people can follow. Everyone will love you. And then make your design constructed, cool, and then you can paint it without a care. So that's 
really nice and cool for uh, man-made stuff because it's so full of edges and um, 90 degree corners and all of that. But what happens in nature, right? Everything's so organic. Um, where are my edges? Like we don't have such a thing. So believe it or not, it is basically the same principle. So um, the trick part here is that you need to group the information that you see. So take this rock, for instance. Um, when I was designing it, I had to look at it. And even though there were no exact matches, because you know have this kind of like a rounded feel, um, there was a part that was pointing slightly upwards over here. And this part was um, more facing towards me. So when I was making my cubes in my boxes that I use for measuring, I was making it, making them that shape. So this box just started out as kind of like two cubes. Um, and then the more I started rendering, the more I started slicing the cubes, like that train and the, the face of the train. So like a good pizza is something really beautiful that you just shove in a box. <laughs> That's how it goes. Um, and yeah, it just um, put it in the cube, put it in perspective, um, and as you can see, it followed exactly the same uh, procedure. So started out with a rough thumbnail, and once I liked it, I, I went with this one because uh, it was a character piece and wanted to feel more intimate. Um, get your grids in, and exactly the same as before. And then, boom, nice and easy. I can just focus on painting now. Um, finally, I wanted to talk about this one. <laughs> so this is from a, uh, it's from a place where uh, I would get like uh, little magic bags from, like um, Mexican food and stuff, which is really, really lovely. And I'm also a big uh, The Owl House fan. And I had this um, uh, idea about uh, King, which is a, a creature, as you can see, um, running in, seeing a snack and wanting a snack and forgetting that he is a creature. Uh, so he just runs into the to get the food and just scares everyone in. And I wanted the uh, perspective to feel dynamic, to feel um, fun and uh, really rush, having this kind of like excited, like nah, um, feeling going on. So I started out in my little ugly sketchbook and I wasn't caring about perspective here, just so wonky. And uh, then once I had something that I liked, I uh, pulled it into Clip Studio and then showed my grids in and adjusted it back and forth and back and forth until I had something that worked. And once I felt that it was kind of sort of working, I started, guess what, blocking it in. Put it all in cubes, big cubes, big cubes. Once I was happy with them and measured them, made them smaller cubes, sliced that cubes, and went on, on, so on and so forth. Uh, this is made from this reference, by the way, and as you can see, it's quite complex. And when something is complex, what do we do? We cube it, we measure it, we divide it, and so on and so forth until you have all the cubes you need. And once you have all the cubes you need, you sketch over the top and the rest is history. So then you can have fun and paint it. Have fun. So yeah, that's essentially what goes on in my brain when I'm designing. Uh, and now I get to show you the cool stuff that I really love about Clip Studio and why I use it for work, even when they use other programs. So whenever I make something from scratch, I will start it in Clip. And the really cool thing is that you can export not only as uh, .clip files, but uh, also as .psd. So I can get stuff from other people, uh, show them to the program, export it as .psd, and uh, just have all the freedom to sketch uh, that I so, so much enjoy. So uh, one of my favorite things is the subview panel. Uh, I sometimes am working with a bunch of references at a time, and I could just have them here and have a flick uh, between them super, super easily. Also, another important thing is to have um, the thumbnails always uh, in show. Oh, just run away. Uh, always, uh, like the ones that I do initially, like the very loose ones, um, I like to keep them here, because then I don't need to be flicking uh, to see they just stay there. So very handy panel. Um, but you know, the hero of the hour are the respective rulers. Wow. So when I come in, um, I uh, get the rulers up, select perspective ruler, and go through the add vanishing point process. And then I proceed to, spoiler alert, add a vanishing point. 
So I'll usually draw one line for my horizon and then another one, whoops, I've got spoilers, um, vanishing point and then where I want it and then it's set. So cool. Um, I'm actually not a grid person. I'm a ruler person. So I like to have things clean and then once uh, as I need it, like, oh, okay, um, where does this converge to again? I come in, go to the process and click add guide and then just flick it through towards the, the vanishing point. Wow, so cool, right? Coming in. Um, so yeah, super nice and easy. And uh, the really cool thing is that it never has dimension. So you can zoom in as much as you want and it will always just be one pixel. Um, when you have rasterized grids, it can interfere with your um, with your measurements. So it will be just slightly off. And then you measure from there and it will be again, just slightly off. Uh, this is what I mean, right? It, it zooms in as I go. Um, and then at the end of the day, you know, after you've uh, measured like five, six things, you go back to the first one, it's just really, really off. So these are great. Um, so that's one vanishing point. Um, how do you add another one? Well, super nice and easy. Do exactly the same thing. You can do it on the same layer if you like. Um, I like to just match the horizon line. And then uh, I don't want it to be to the form this time. So I'll just do a little bit of a bend and pow. There he is. Yonks away. <laughs> um, and then exactly the same procedure. Just change it to add guide. If you just want to add a guide to see where it's converging to. Super nice and cool, right? And what about a third vanishing point? Same thing, uh, just this time I will not be using the horizon line because the third one uh, acts slightly differently. Um, and once again, just add guys if I want to. And super cool thing, uh, when I'm designing, when I'm measuring, I really enjoy using uh, the, the figure tool, uh, set it to straight line and make sure it's snapping to special rulers and you can enable or disable using uh, uh, control two, which is this little orange wedge over there. So if I wanted to draw a cube um, that follows the vanishing points, this is what it does. There we go. And now it's going to into space. There we go. There we go. Whoopsie. I went a little bit too far there. And now it's screaming at me. Why, why are you like this? Um, just deleting that, going back. See, super nice and easy and intuitive. And your brush tool will also do the same thing. So if you have the wedge um, enabled, it will also follow those lines. But what if I want to do a diagonal now? It's okay, control two, and you can do it. So fun. Um, you can also, um, I usually don't use this, um, but it's uh, really nice and helpful for a lot of my, my colleagues, uh, and maybe for you, who knows? If you go on operation tool, an object and you can click them and change them. Wow. So that uh, vanishing point that we put beforehand, you can just edit it. You can also grab uh, the horizon line and change it. See how everything else is changing. Super cool. Um, and it's uh, always ed editable. You can lock stuff, unlock it. Um, and really interesting is the grid tool. So you can just ask Clip to create grids for you and it does. And it just looks <laughs> so scary. Um, but yeah, you can go and do it on um, just one, two, or three, which is super, super helpful as well. Um, yes, so now to make things spicier, you can also create fisheye tools, fisheye grids, which is a, a, a new feature that I just absolutely love. So I'll usually start with my horizon line and I click and drag to set it. And then I set my curvature. Look at that. Whee! I'm going to set it there and then click and I have a vanishing point. So if I add guides, boom, 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 they are circling. <laughs> uh, and then the same thing. If I want to add a vanishing point, I'll usually just do the same following the horizon line, same as before setting where I want it to be, and then guides. Pow, pow, I want you to come here. Cool, it's coming there. There we go, there we go. And 
The cool thing is that the straight line stops being straight. Look at that. Perfect circles. And I'm not even trying. Wait. Um, yeah, it's super, super fun. Um, another, like, this is my go-to thing. I can't tell you how much I use this tool, uh, the liquify brush. Um, I will sometimes, um, not sometimes, constantly have uh, backgrounds that I already rendered and then I need to make changes to them. And usually that makes me want to cry, but I can actually make changes to a lot of them without having to redraw them by using this really nifty tool, uh, by using the liquify brush, I can just adjust them and uh, nudge them in a very easily controllable way. So you have all these uh, cool settings that you can play around with. Um, yeah, and we have all of these and we have so many layers on that I want to turn off right now because I can't really see what I'm doing. So bye, 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 goodbye. Cool. Um, I was talking earlier about floor plans. So uh, I want to show you uh, one final tool that is amazing for it. So let's say that we have, um, do you remember that character from, from before, the one that was studying? So she has a room and let's say the bed is here and she also has a bedside table, right? Bedside table and another bedside table. And let's make them a different color so I know what's what. Cool. And then she has her desk over here, right? And I'll be measuring this. Let's pretend I measure this. <laughs> Right, so I'll say this because this is the floor plan. Um, let me just go and call it floor plan. There we go, that's my floor plan. And now I, you know, I'm ready to construct my uh, beautiful design. So what I do, I go on file, I go on import, I go on create file object, and I get my floor plan. And boom, there is the floor plan. And here's a cool thing, if you just go on free transform, you can go in and uh, make it match the perspective that you've drawn. So just, come on, work with me, work with me. <laughs> so just following the, the grids that I put in uh, before. So that's where the horizon line is. That's where the vanishing point is. There we go. That's, that's very stretched out. Let's like that. Okay, it's not super accurate. Let's pretend it was accurate. Cool. And now my art director comes in and tells me, uh, Mariana, actually, uh, the desk was supposed to be like on the other side of the room. And I go, well, no problem. Because I can just very easily come in, just move it down, press save. And guess what? and I didn't have to do anything. So um, it's super cool uh, because then it helps to um, keep track of where everything is and um, your depth is always consistent. Like the more you deform it, um, it doesn't really matter because then you can also just readjust and it will also always, always be consistent. So yeah, uh, some more important notes uh, to take from here, important notes. Um, you're always going to be going back to the drawing board, literally. So like I said before, it is really nice when things go according to plan. But um, if when you start having issues, you don't take a step back um, and uh, reassess, you will be building from a, a weak foundation. <laughs> In my first job, I still remember this. Uh, we had um, a, a tough client that wanted something that was never going to look good. And I was just demotivated that I was having to um, make this thing anyway. And he sits me down and goes like, Mariana, I get it. It's okay. Sometimes in life, you can't, you know, you can't polish a turn. You can only roll it in glitter. <laughs> and what this means is um, if you don't go back and make it nice, you'll always only be... Um, rolling it in glitter. It will look better than before, but it will never look polished. So go back, redo it, and then build your stuff up. Then we go on to depth. Depth is the, probably for me, like the 
hardest concept to grasp about perspective. Um, so like I said, the math bit is that everything obeys the same ratio. And over here, I have put down a, a little grid and these are squares so that you can see um, what everything measures. So these dice, all sides measure the same. So you can see this just works because this one measures two and this one measures two. And you know, cool. But then this one feels weird. And why is that? It's because this side because it's closer to the horizon line, it actually measures four. And when we don't use grids or when we're not measuring, because uh, there are many different ways to, to use perspective, if we don't use one of those methods and you don't keep checking, um, if you just wing it, it will look okay to your eye, but it will actually be wrong. And then you get to a point that you're then comparing the wrong element, um, using it as a term of comparison, and you just create this game of Gothic foam where you've compared to stuff that was not entirely accurate so much that your drawing stops making sense. And you look at it, and you're like, ah, it feels wrong, but I don't know what's going on. Nine times out of 10, it's death. Um, another important one, visuals are king. So what I mean by this is don't leave it up for interpretation. Say it, spell it. If your character is a fisherman and it's uh, their environment, their space, I want to be seen fishing rods, I want to see um, buckets, I want to see hooks, I want to see uh, big coats, uh, I want to see nautical gear. D don't just be like, oh, this is a cupboard, and he has all of, it, all of this stuff inside the cupboard. No, I want to look at it and know exactly who lives there. Um, again, if you're struggling and it gets overwhelming, take a step back, go touch grass, go for a walk, get some vitamin D, come back, and just draw with no rules. Uh, get your sketchbook out, get your uh, draft paper out, and just doodle to your heart's desire. Um, then it will help you uh, tackle and find the issues that you're struggling with. Um, and last but not least, we know the rules so that we can cheat them. So smart cheating, um, you will sometimes uh, want a, an element to be really nice and visible. Like I really want my fishing rods to be the, the focus of them. Um, of the scene, but then there's this cupboard that's just in front of it, or a bed that's kind of covering it. If you're jumping between shots, you can turn it off, um, especially um, if uh, it's, a, it's a jump cut. And um, most important takeaway, you it always has to be believable. We don't cheat the rules of perspective, because if you just um, don't obey them, it stops being believable, but we work with them to uh, play around. So yeah, that is how my brain works. Uh, that was a lot of information. Um, but yeah, I have a lot of fun when I'm uh, doing art and I have fun when I'm not doing art because that's also important. So I hope you've been uh, inspired and you make some more art of your, uh, yourself. So thank you so much. That's me. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Mariana. This has been a spectacular webinar. <laughs> Everyone is really happy. Uh, they're sending a lot of love. Uh, so um, let's see. There, there are people from all around the world watching us. So thank you, Sarah from Iran, Fenja from Germany. Um, who else? Heli, sorry if I mispronounced. Heli <laughs> Mayagia from Finland. Alice from Philippines, Fred from Congo, Jeffrey from Indonesia, um, Janet from Mexico, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So thank you all of you who are joining us, um, and we are really sorry about the technical issue. We started uh, 15 minutes late, but we appreciate all the support on your on socials and, and for continuing being here. So with that, one of the most repetitive questions was about. How much does it take you from start to finish in terms of timeline? Ooh, that is a very good question. Um, so when I'm at work and I'm working from places that already exist, so I will have um, these shoe boxes. Um, so I know what the room looks like. Uh, if it is a very, like a wide shot, like really big, um, and I need to draw it, um, it usually takes me one day. If it's a very complex shot, you know, but if it's a close-up, so I will just have this part of the room, it's less stuff. So it can just be half day or sometimes even less. So depends on the how complex it is. Um, 
when I was doing location design for the work uh, for the, the place that I'm working at right now, it took me about a week to make one white shot uh, that looked like um, that. It took me about a week because I was designing everything from scratch. I was doing the, all those free doodles and building well. So um, I hope that answers it. <laughs> Definitely. Um, here's another question uh, from Ines. Hello, I would like to ask, what are the techniques used in order to make the smooth blurry effect on the elements in the front that creates depth of field? Thank you. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, um, I actually just go on here, blur, and go motion blur, um, and then play around with the intensity. So it's just really cool. I will just draw them uh, tight, like this one, without blur, and just go on there, filter, and motion blur. There you go. Mm -hmm. Here's another question from Ellie uh, Subisita. Uh, what to do if the perspective makes the image look wonky and wrong? Right, so uh, usually when that happens, it's because uh, you're using uh, too much of a deformed perspective. So um, you have to, again, go back to the drawing board and experiment with different um, uh, rulers. So, what I mean by that is if you have uh, vanishing points that are too close, go away, Fisher, uh, too close to each other, it will create super, super um, deformed stuff. So if I did this, uh, there we go, um, and then started building from here, then things would become so crazy. So this is where the horizon line is, and I'm trying to draw, stop snapping. There we go. Things will just become super, super deformed. Like so. Yeah, so um, if things are getting too wonky, sorry, that was a terrible, <laughs> terrible down. Um, if it's too wonky, then just go grab your um, uh, vanishing point and just put it further away because uh, I have encountered that issue many, many times. And uh, a lot of the times it's because it's just too extreme. See, it's already so much easier to draw on it and then construct. There we go. Cool. <laughs> At least in my experience. Mm -hmm. And then also another question about if you can uh, show us again how to create a curved perspectives. Cool. Um, so I'm still getting learning more about it. Um, but in general, you uh, go on a perspective ruler, add vanishing point, and then you add a fisheye. And uh, when you press down, you uh, click and hold, and it's going to put your start point and your end point. So you click and drag. Do you see underneath my cursor, there's a little tick. And then once you leave, let it go, you know, one tick, two ticks, you then choose the curvature. So now I grab with my little hand and go, wow. And this creates your world. So this is more deformation, this is less deformation. Um, and then the world is built. And now um, I put down my vanishing point. I'm going to put it right here. There we go. So like before, um, you have to do one extra step comparing to the previous ones because um, you're, you have the circle factor. But after you have the circle in, uh, it's super, super, it works It works exactly the same way. So if you were to add another one, uh, I like to go overlap the, um, the horizon to make sure that they're matching, and then it creates it. And then it's the same thing as before. So we have one vanishing point here and the other one there. So if I flick the mouse uh, to there, it catches this one. If I flick Towards that side, it catches the other one. So yeah, um, it's basically the same thing, but it happens with curves. So you do that first step at the beginning, where you go vanishing point, and then you start and finish, and then you choose your curvature, and then the rest is the same. <laughs> I hope that adds a bit. Definitely, and thank you again for sharing it. Uh, well, before we continue with questions, uh, 
thank all of you who are sharing your Instagram story with the hashtag webinar at Enoloyastastic at Graphicsly at Welcome and at Clip Studio Official. We are sharing your stories. And also thanks all of you who are still sending love, for example, uh, awesome webinar, thanks from Aram, and greetings from Colombia, Fairly, uh, Brazil also, Susan, Terry from US, uh, Dallas says that was an amazing presentation, thank you so much for your advice, very interesting Dave. So um, next question will be from uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen Hills, uh, did color theory come naturally or did you have to study up on it, please? Hi, okay, so um, as an artist, I design myself. This is me. This is me again. <laughs> this way. I design with the brain and I paint with the heart. And what that means is that when I'm, I'm designing, I need to actively be thinking about rules of design um, and uh, to push my, my shape language, to push my proportions, hierarchy. With color, the way I do it is um, I will put things together. Uh, have as little color as I can. I'll just that one, one or two, and I will compare the two and uh, keep going until it feels right. It's very much the same way as uh, the way I get dressed in the morning. I'll put like um, a yellow ochre uh, turtleneck next to my black trousers and be like, well, does this go together? And then I get my shoes, add it in, like, does this go together? Um, but yeah, if you struggle with color, my advice is strip down as much as you can. Uh, color, colors, <laughs> information, <laughs> take the um, stuff out, uh, get down to just two, and build from there. And once it feels uh, like it's working, then you start dividing, then you start adding. Uh, we actually have a webinar that I've done with uh, Graphicsly about plein air painting and about color that you can, can go check out. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and you definitely need to check out. Uh, also, uh, some of you have asked about the recording. Yes, we are recording it, so don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Graphicsly. Um, another question uh, from Janet. Uh, what do you like to draw the most in perspective? Oh, I definitely really love cars. <laughs> I love drawing wonky cars, wonky vehicles, and uh, technical stuff. So as you can probably tell um, from this one, I just love gears and cogs and uh, the way things uh, come together. Because um, yeah, I don't, I don't just like to put it and say, oh, cartoon logic, it will work. No, I want to actually make it work. I want them to rotate. To I want to know where the power comes from, what, how the axes. There's a whole thing. I can tell you how this whole caravan works. <laughs> so yeah, I really love um, the vehicles and mechanical stuff. <laughs> and that leads us for another good question we received about how do you deal with characters in perspective? Do you have a tip for that? Yes, cry a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, in all seriousness, um, I do like uh, there's no. Um, not a secret i am not the, the strongest of characters so okay i i do good characters but my level in environments is much higher but i also worked as um designer and i've done like actually my last job before this one I, 90 percent of it was doing characters so the thing is same as before same as i get pizza you shove it in a little square box um and you can actually see if i start um uh, adding things in. Uh, I was actually struggling a little bit with these. Um, it's the same thing. So I, I have them boxed in um, into small shapes. Um, I don't have it, but I, I drew the characters beforehand, same as the, uh, the, the shoebox view. Uh, and then when I was finished with the layout, um, you know, I have them in the thumbnail. So I knew where I was roughly going to put them. Um, and I usually like to create the layout before and then have the characters that I can then place. And is the same thing, um, again, let me just go through the very embarrassing first stages. So <laughs> I will have like little boxes and then I do these uh, little sketches on top and I start uh, rendering out and correcting it. 
until something feels right. So this is where it started to feel more or less right to me, because you also, you know, she is above the horizon line. So I will be looking from below. I can see her draw, draw line, but then her knees and legs are below. So I'm looking down at them um, and then making sure that the flow uh, sticks and only after all these iterations, do you remember what I said about having to go back and forth? This is what I mean. <laughs> um, so yes, I did have to go touch grass a bit with this one. It was quite tricky and I kept like struggling and trying to correct it. But in the end, we got there. So like anything else, you have to keep going back and forth, put it in a box. And if it's not feeling right, don't try to make it work. Go back correct it, try it again. <laughs> That's my best advice with characters. That's actually a really good advice, thank you. <laughs> and unfortunately our time is limited, but we can go with one last question from Anika, which is very interesting. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what is the one thing or tips uh, you will have told yourself if you can go back when you started learning about perspective? Oh. My number one tip is always don't put too much pressure on yourself uh, because I will see this, these works that would inspire me. And instead of just, you know, uh, realizing that I needed to take my time, I would uh, feel too pressured on myself to make things that looked perfect. And I didn't give myself enough time to just fail and enjoy um, failing. Um, uh, so like, when you break into the industry, you um, really, when you're trying to break in, especially after you finish school, you try to do what everyone else is doing because they're getting hired. And, um, you know, the same thing with uh, perspective, I have to do exactly the same things. But believe it or not, the way you use perspective says a lot about you. So um, when I started, when, you know, I was so frustrated with not getting anywhere that I got to a point that I went, well, this is not working, um, so I don't care anymore. I'm just going to do art because I like it and I'm just going to have fun. And the moment I started doing that without realizing, I started creating a language for myself because I was telling the stories um, that I wanted to tell. I started spending less, so much time at the computer. I actually went out, got new hobbies, got into woodworking. <laughs> and um, being able to do that, I had so many more stories to tell and um, I would sit down and from these new hobbies that I was starting, I uh, was actually much kinder because I wasn't trying to apply for jobs. I was just doing them for fun and I got used to failing. So if I make a wonky shelf, it's okay. No one is trying to buy the wonky shelf. Like there's no supervisor telling me it's wrong. It's just wonky and that's okay. And it became fun to learn from my mistakes. And then I learned that that has also to be the way that my brain works when I'm making up. It's okay to make mistakes um, and it's even more gratifying to learn from them. So <laughs> TLDR, let yourself make mistakes. Don't expect it to be perfect and really remember that you're also supposed to be having fun with it. So that is my answer to that. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for those wise words, uh, Mariana. <laughs> this has been another uh, really enlightening webinar for all of us. We learned a lot, where we can uh -huh. tell by the comments of the people. So thank you so much. Thank all of you who waited and, and stayed here live. I know a lot of you are in different time zones, so it's difficult. Uh, but we thank all of you, uh, not only for this, but also for all the webinars you have uh, participated uh, during 2023. So we are really hoping to bring you more and, and more talented artists where you can learn new techniques and experience from them. Uh, so before we go, let me just uh, share one last bit of information. You will find the recording of this webinar in our YouTube channel Graphicsly and also Clip Studio Paint channel. So please subscribe to get a notification once, once it's available to watch. Also learn more about Clip Studio in our website clipstudio.net forward slash n and graphicsly.com. And for more information about Mariana and her projects, don't forget to follow her on Instagram and Twitter or X or how you <laughs> like it more. 
as not only a statistic uh, in bold and also on her website and uh, mcnoronia.com so with that once again thank you so much mariana it's my pleasure <laughs> thank all of you uh, we see you next time uh, have a happy holidays and see you in 2024 bye bye stay tuned bye, -bye. see you later